Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Francois, for the invitation. I'm uh, really um, pleased to be here uh, and uh, um, share with you this, uh, um, let's say, journey that started uh, five or six years ago. When we're discussing, like Marco said, is there something that we want to work on and uh, um, which uh, angle should we take? Uh, how can we make it uh, an integral part of uh, of the wireless system architecture? So back then in uh, 2018, it was uh, uh, for sure not obvious. And uh, I, I just need to share with you that uh, we were preparing this uh, project proposal five years ago, and uh, literally uh, there was no reference to include in uh, the proposal on RIS. So there was only one maybe or two archive papers and nothing. So we felt a bit, you know, uh, kind of uncertain and guilty. And are we doing the right thing if we are starting something and there are no papers to, to cite? Well, I can now tell you that uh, only a few months uh, after that phase, there were thousands of papers on RIS. So it was an unbelievable, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, curve that uh, since then it's unstoppable. So I think that, uh, uh, I don't know if it was luck or if it, uh, it will help a little, but uh, uh, somehow it was uh, a good choice, I think, at least. I can say that we learned a lot. So even for that, I think is enough. So what I'm going to do today is, first of all, a, a small introduction on uh, 6G scenarios, uh, only as a motivation why we want still to discuss uh, technologies like this. And then um, I will briefly um, explain, if you want, um, how RIS can be helpful. But I will do that from the point of view of uh, analytical description of uh, how an RIS works. So um, you want to, you may want to call it electromagnetic point of view, but it won't contain the stochastic uh, element of the wireless behavior. It will be, uh, uh, if you want a way to analytically assess, uh, if you have an RIS in a wireless link, what do you expect from the properties of the electromagnetic environment that will be created around it. So first, uh, uh, I will uh, start from where we started a few years ago, which is to consider RIS as a tunable reflector uh, and uh, briefly explain what is now very well known, of course, is the principle of uh, beyond Shannon intelligence. Uh, I, I was going, I was thinking of also addressing the uh, issue of uh, using RIS as a spatial filter, but because this is a very long discussion and because we have ongoing work at the moment, I will leave that from this presentation. So maybe for another next presentation, uh, just also for the interest of time. And then I will, uh, uh, even following the way that we learn things, I will talk about RIS, um, as a way to uh, engineer the wavefront. And finally, how RIS can be used to uh, serve this new system concept that uh, you heard about, uh, which is called uh, joint communication and sensing or integrated communication and sensing. And then I will conclude. So in terms of the scenarios for uh, the upcoming generation 6G, um, of course, there are many variants and many flavors in describing those scenarios, but, uh, and it was discussed also in previous talk today, and I'm sure you have heard about them. Um, if I had to summarize, I would say that uh, I would uh, um, list four main trends for this in, for these uh, uh, usage scenarios. So these four trends are shown in the picture. So the first one is what I call, what we used to call in another uh, framework, of research fiber over the air when we studied terahertz communication. So uh, you may call it uh, ubiquitous connectivity or inclusion or things like that, but it is the idea of providing connectivity uh, of a very high rate and uh, reliability 
everywhere and uh, to everyone. So this is one main trend on the scenarios. The second trend is that of the uh, immersive uh, experience. So the idea of uh, being uh, reconfigurable, being able to adapt, to tune uh, the wireless environment, and uh, in that way, uh, come up with, with solutions to obstruct it, uh, uh, propagation, for example, uh, come up with solutions about uh, um, digital twinning or uh, uh, virtual reality applications, etc. So this is like if you want a way to uh, have a completely new approach to wireless, which is a tunable, a programmable, and adaptive wireless. So this is a second trend. A third trend is about intelligence. So the idea you we heard about um, uh, the use of uh, um, optimization tools, machine learning, and other tools. The idea of uh, incorporated intelli incorporating intelligence, um, and uh, this what it means. It means that uh, the wireless network is able to learn not only to find the optimal solution for each particular set of parameters, but it uh, is able to teach itself how to solve problems, how to uh, react, if you want, to a new stochastic snapshot of, uh, of reality. And the fourth trend in this scenario is the, is the sensing part. Is This is kind of, if you want, uh, uh, twofold in some way, because it is the ability to sense the environment using the communication network. So this is uh, uh, somehow um, a new way of uh, defining sensing that was already well known in wireless sensor networks. Uh, the other flavor in it is to use sensing to improve the communication network. So this is more like uh, taking into account other types of information, like for example, semantic information, or other types of uh, information to improve the network. So um, these are the main trends. Uh, this uh, wheel diagram was shown also, uh, also in the morning by Marco. Uh, this is what the ITUR came up with in terms of uh, summarizing the various trends and uh, also in terms of reflecting how the, the usage scenarios for 6G um, are not just an evolution of the 5G scenario, but they also contain the new items. And these new items you see there in, uh, in blue uh, are the, about integrating uh, communication and sensing, about the ubiquitous connectivity and the intelligence. So it seems that uh, in order to be able to address these scenarios, in order to be able to design technologies and then evaluate them, you need probably to also evolve uh, performance metrics. So capacity uh, and uh, the traditional performance metrics may not be sufficient anymore. So uh, in the sense that you want to characterize, for example, the sensing capability, accuracy, reliability, resolution, uh, the, but the capability of understanding the semantics, or uh, if you want the, the, the energy efficiency that was discussed earlier, and so many other uh, metrics that are now maybe becoming, in particular some scenarios, so critical. So having said that, I will just show you a diagram that we used this five years or more ago to describe our initial take on RIS, and that was in the Ariadne project. So in, in the Ariadne project, um, I think we were a bit like uh, five years early in some respect compared to the ITU diagram. We wanted to combine three pillars. So the first pillar was the technology, the enabler of RIS. The second pillar was the design of wireless transceivers that are able to uh, incorporate tunability, what we call beyond Shannon, because now the channel itself is part of the design, not just the, uh, the transmitter and the receiver. And the third pillar was the use of uh, machine learning in order to be able to optimize, in order to be able to make tunability an integral part of the design. So this is what we um, proposed uh, in, uh, 
2019. Uh, and that was the main framework for uh, Ariadne. But what I'm, I'm going to talk today is only a part of the work, a small part of the work of Ariadne, and how this work was uh, in our group continued to the next step, if you want. So tunability, uh, the good thing about being the last is that everything was explained before. So I think you, you are very familiar with everything I'm going to show, uh, which is good. Uh, so I'm going to be very brief. So. Uh, reconfigurable self intelligent surfaces uh, uh, are uh, this uh, uh, set of unit cells that uh, uh, apparently were hoping to be able to tune their uh, reflective behavior. So in uh, doing that, what matters, of course, as it was very nicely explained in previous talks, is uh, uh, the size, the material, and uh, the number of these elements. Um, so our first task when studying RIS is to consider an RIS aided link, so transceiver, RIS, and um, transmitter, RIS, and receiver, and then try to see what are the elements of this uh, new transceiver system model that we want to tune, and how we can really analytically characterize the, their behavior in order to have explicit representation of the parameters that we want to tune. Because obviously there are other ways of doing it. You can, for example, create a stochastic framework and then uh, have Monte Carlo simulations to try to understand its behavior. But the problem that sometimes arises in such an approach is that you don't have the explicit representation of parameters. So you cannot really know uh, which way you want to include them in your design. Um, so usual trade-off, the analytical models might be sometimes oversimplifications that give you an explicit dependence on parameters. The stochastic models might be more realistic because they try to represent reality, which is stochastic, but they don't provide you insight to the parameters that you would like to know. So, you know, it is the usual design trade-off we, we need to live with. So in this analytical modeling, we try to understand the interplay between um, the beam shape that illuminates the RIS from the access point, which is the transmitter, uh, creating a certain footprint on the RIS. Then the RIS re responds it itself, for example, trying to steer a beam, assuming that, for example, we are in the far field. And finally, the topology of these three elements, the transmitter, the RIS and the receiver. So we studied that and we come, came up with analytical expressions for the received power at any point in the system and try to understand how this received power behaves, for example, uh, as a function of the access point, as a function of the distances between the access point and the RIS or between the RIS and uh, the UE. So, that help us understand uh, the anatomy of this behavior. And uh, it was what we expected, but we also be we were able to quantify it, uh, to put a number, if you want, on it, that there are two regions. There is the region of uh, low access point gain we, that you see here with the gray um, uh, highlight. And there is a region of the high access point gain. And apparently what happens is that uh, when you are in the high access point gain, what you experience is that the receive power decreases because of the path loss. And when you are in the low access point gain, what you see is that the receive power is actually dependent on the distance uh, of the distance or, uh, between the RIS and the UE. Why is that? Because you are in the near field and actually the power is practically constant. So this analytical model help us quantify these two regions, the near field and the far field, and uh, also confirm or validate in numbers that there is actually a turning point where the AC power is uh, maximized. The second thing that we try to, to understand is, is uh, so that was the situation previously what we call here infinite RIS is not really infinite, is that uh, 
uh, the RAS is quite uh, larger than the footprint that you illuminated with. You look, uh, so it's relatively infinite, right? Uh, because the, the footprint that you uh, illuminate with is always smaller than the size of the RIS. And one w what we call finite uh, RIS is that you are illuminating the whole RIS. So by checking the behavior of the received power as a function of uh, this um, illumination, if you want, we came up with another quantification the behavior of the RIS between the infinite and the finite regimes. And what happens is that when it reaches the finite regime, this means that actually it captures all the energy that it can capture. Okay. And this is the reason why you see, for example, that uh, in, the, in the low part uh, on the right, you see that it reaches 100% of uh, uh, the power, and it cannot go further than that. So these two help us develop a, a framework where you can actually use the access point gain as the means to tune. So imagine the access point gain as a way to uh, tune the footprint of the RIS and therefore change the regime between near field and far field, or the regime between finite and infinite, right? And more than that, we have developed an optimization framework where you can, in this analytical model, you can find, you see also shown here graphically, the sweet spot, the optimal way of using this uh, gain, right? But in a framework where you can introduce, if you want, stochastic parameters, of course, you can use these analytical expressions to, uh, uh, if you want to, to tune your optimization tool, right? So this is our first exercise. So in our first exercise, RIS is a way to come up with a better, if you want, uh, receive power in a similar way that you would use beam forming in a system, right? So all you care about is your SNR. You want to be able to optimize SNR everywhere. You also want to be able to, for example, uh, come up with solutions that uh, could uh, use RIS in order to be able to improve over your wireless environment. Say, for example, that there are some blockages. So you can locate uh, the, uh, you can position the RIS in uh, uh, spaces where it helps you come up uh, with uh, solutions to obstructed uh, line of sight. The next step, the next phase of this study that was also part of the Ariadne project uh, is that we studied the actual placement. So the topology of this transmitter, RIS and receiver. So we started with some, something very simple. What you see here on the left, um, imagine that uh, there is an RIS on the ceiling, right? And it is able to move along a line so what you want to understand is what is the optimal position if uh, at uh, the one end of this line there is the transmitter and the other end there is the receiver. And as you would expect by moving the RIS, now you move the RIS and uh, the transmitter and the receiver, they stay still. By moving the RIS, you essentially move the shape and the size of the footprint, you see? So again, we analytically characterize the received power and we uh, were able to uh, observe two distinct cases, the full illumination, which is what I called before finite uh, RIS and the partial illumination, which is what I called be uh, before infinite RIS. So you see, for example, that in the full illumination case, you have this symmetry that there are two maxima. Uh, it is uh, what you see there, the green line. Whereas with uh, the partial, there is only one. So in that respect, there is an interplay between illumination of the RIS, which has to do with the access point gain that we said before and the actual size of the RIS. And 
the positions, the distances between the three elements. And uh, another step further in uh, the optimization of this topology of the RIS aided link was to try to understand the combination between positioning and orientation. So what if you are able to change the angle with which the RIS uh, is facing your transmitter and your receiver? So we introduce uh, the orientation and we uh, came up with analytical expression that essentially, um, if you want to express, gives, gives you an expression on the distance between the RIS and the UE as a function of the power that you would like to achieve. So this uh, uh, PTH is the threshold of the power, of the required power, and D, UE, TH is the distance. So in that um, way, we wanted to be able to equip, let's say ourselves, with the closed expressions that uh, contain all the parameters that one would need, for example, if there was a system level optimization tool as to where to uh, put the RISs in a network. So that was uh, what we did. Uh, and uh, of course, another very important uh, um, part of our work was to try to understand what happens when there is mobility. Uh, in previous works, we have studied the problem of beamforming tracking. How, for example, you can use prediction uh, to improve the complexity performance trade off of your beamforming tracking. So, we, based on that work, we introduce now a risk aided beamforming tracking that essentially what it does is that it is able to track the user and uh, uh, also doing so to help the situations where the user, by moving, is in his way while while moving is obstructed by obstacles by blockages so this is a very uh, if you want uh, at least when we started uh, studying at is that was a scenario that was considered quite uh, important because there the main motivation behind using it was was actually to to try to come up with solutions about blockages so that was if you want the first part of the work. Uh, and um, we did that uh, within Ariadne. Uh, of course, what I'm showing here is some uh, of the work that my team did, but there were other teams. And uh, uh, for example, working on uh, coming up with machine learning solutions. So these guys, they would need the analytical models to be able to use them in, in their, or system level analysis, similar, uh, et cetera. So that was what I'm showing here is if you want uh, a way to understand the uh, analytical uh, behavior and performance. Um, when studying that, um, and that was focusing mainly on the D-band, so we were in the sub terahertz uh, regime, it became obvious that um, this near field versus far field, it was not only about characterizing the received power, so we, um, by just uh, studying the behavior of the beam forming, for example, in the two regimes, we understood that uh, there, is, there are characteristics that need some further understanding in the near field. So obviously, I don't need to justify that. You, you all know that uh, uh, as you go up in frequency, what happens is that uh, and actually the uh, Fraunhofer distance changes and uh, a user that uh, in lower frequencies used to be in the far field, now all of a sudden is in the near field. And actually this is uh, the case for a substantial, if you want distance from the transmitter. I mean, it's not just, uh, uh, so if you're talking about uh, uh, tens of meters, then in most of the scenarios that I showed you before, when I started the presentation, you are actually in the near field. So the idea was to, well, there are many ways to see the near field, let's face it. I mean, you can say that, as you see, it's obvious from the picture that there are many degrees of freedom. So if I had a way to, to structure them, 
to use them in a natural way, then that's uh, perfect. I, I can take advantage of those. But if uh, I cannot, uh, uh, if you won't understand them or detect them in a natural way, then it's, it complicates my beam forming. So my beam forming does not uh, do what I was thinking it was doing, because as you can see, uh, it looks quite uh, complicated, the behavior of uh, uh, the response in such a, uh, in the near field uh, domain. So what we did is to stay, to take like a step back and um, try to see what is worth doing uh, in addition or to complement or as an alternative to the classical beam forming. So uh, by writing down the general expression, of course, there are infinite things that you can do. Right? I mean, you can tune your uh, phase for the reflective beams in a way that it does anything you like, at least on paper, anything. Um, so the first thing that was an obvious thing to try was to try beam focusing. So the idea of beam focusing is instead of having um, a linear phase, to use, for example, a parabolic phase in order to be able to concentrate the power to a specific point. So beam focusing is uh, a very nice way to exploit the properties of the near field, especially if you are interested, not only just to optimize received power, but uh, to optimize re received power density. So this is what uh, beam focusing can do. So received power density is now the new metric. And the idea is, what is the interplay between the RIS, the footprint that, uh, with which you illuminate the, your RIS, the RIS response, and the topology. So the, po the positioning, the distances between the three elements. So similar exercise for us uh, with what we did for beam forming, but now in a new near field type of approach that uh, takes advantage of uh, uh, beam focusing. So in a, in a, in a similar way with more complicated um, analytical expressions, but I don't think that matters. Uh, you can find all the details in the, in the papers. Um, we uh, characterize this power density as a function of uh, the radius of the footprint, which is here called the W rays, um, as a function of uh, the distance between the transmitter and uh, the RIS. Um, you see, for example, here, as you would expect, that uh, um, as a, when uh, you have uh, the distance, uh, the larger distance, right, it gives you the higher, um, uh, the higher power density. Why is that? It is because you you can exploit a larger, a better footprint in that way. Uh, and uh, as a function of uh, the transmitter angle, for example, so you can illuminate your wrist from different angles. And uh, by changing this uh, angle, you, what you change is actually the shape and the size of the footprint. So you are able to uh, ma make a, a larger aperture for your focusing and focus better, achieving higher um, power density. And. Uh, uh, another important parameter is the focal distance. So what is the focal distance that you are aiming at? Uh, and you see, as you would again would expect, that uh, uh, when you have uh, your focal distance, your focal point closer to you, then you achieve higher density. When you focus further away from you, then you achieve lower density. Uh, we also uh, came up with analytical expressions about the uh, the focusing direction, similar to what I showed you before for the beam forming, in order to be able to uh, co combine, if you want, or uh, associate in a closed form uh, the position, DUE, as a function of the angle. So all our parameters um, showed us the importance of uh, being able to uh, 
if you want to ensure that you can have a larger aperture. So the larger the aperture of the footprint, the better you can focus with the higher uh, power density. So because can you imagine in our system model, what the, the way that you tune your system is by uh, illuminating from the right distance with the right access point gain, the IIS. So there is no other, let's say, intelligence other than that. So it is uh, like you are, uh, if you want um, triggering with your access point DRIS to come up with the right shape and size in order to be able to achieve the optimal uh, focal area. So why do you want to use focusing? You want to make sure, for example, that uh, uh, the large amount of, uh, of the power is concentrated on a point, right? Or you want to create a focal area where you want to ensure that uh, uh, a certain percentage of uh, this power is within that area. So focusing is a way to towards, if you want, um, energy efficiency is a way of uh, partitioning the environment into focal areas where you know exactly their sizes and, and behavior. So focusing, uh, if you want to compare it in numbers with beamforming, can offer you this, uh, um, if you want um, control, I would say, over power density, which is not the case with beamforming. So beamforming, you can design in order to be able to um, guarantee, if you could, a certain value of the received power, but not more than that. But with beam focusing, you can actually have control over an area, over the density of the power within an area. And this is another a description of what I just said. Uh, so how the focal area is actually controlled. Um, we use as a metric the full width hat maximum, but one can use other metrics. Um, so you want to define the properties of the focal area, for example, to include this half maximum uh, border, if you want, and then use that as the definition of your focal area and see how this uh, behaves as you change, for example, uh, the size of uh, the footprint, the distances, uh, the focal distance, etc. cetera. Um, the, of course, focusing is not, uh, I mean, one can see focusing as a generic framework. It doesn't have to be necessarily that you want to guarantee focal areas of certain size, right? It, um, just to give you an example, it's not the only one. You can uh, create more examples if you want. Uh, one can create multiple uh, focus beams. So one can uh, split the, the instant beams to multiple focus beams towards certain directions. And uh, this is what we did as an example only to, to say that uh, um, one can see the focus, uh, the focusing uh, approach as a new way of forming, of shaping the wavefront. Uh, right, and that can mean that uh, uh, not only as a single, if you want, direction um, strategy, but as a multi-direction strategy. Say, for example, that you want to um, say have user group or uh, broadcast to to selected users, right? Or uh, say, for example, that you want to uh, you know the main paths of your multipath, right? And you want to focus energy to specific directions. So we have created that example only to demonstrate um, the flexibility of, of, of the approach and potential interesting, interesting uh, extensions of this approach. So that was uh, part of, uh, let's say, our learning curve within the wavefront engineering space. Um, that we are now uh, continuing, by the way, um, and try to extend to not direct, um, let's say, continuation of that, but 
uh, a little bit more exotic somehow. <clears throat> so another uh, extension of this uh, wavefront engineering approach is to consider a generalization of the beam. So beam is not only about uh, beam forming, it's not about beam focusing, but uh, let's say that beam is any type of shape. Um, anything that uh, um, helps you direct, um, let's say, power towards some directions, right? Let's call it that way. So what if we were able to create beams with any shape we like? So what if we were able to come up with a desired desirable trajectory and would create beams of the same shape. So that's the concept. It sounds a bit, you know, extreme, but that's the concept. Um, in uh, that respect, uh, we can use, of course, the with something that is well known, uh, but is not really used in wireless or I think not that much discussed in wireless. Now it's starting though is the idea of bending beams. So what if we were able to create beams that turn? Um, and uh, in that way, they're able to avoid obstacles. So it is an alternative to blockage avoidance. Or they are able to avoid areas. Or they are able to turn and somehow, if you want, do some kind of uh, physical layer routing for example. Um, so we are now, as we speak, we are actually running some simulations on, on take, taking that further. But wh what we've done so far is uh, at least we've come up with the analytical framework of bending beams um, to follow a convex trajectory. So any, any type of trajectory that you can imagine which is convex is possible to implement here. Uh, and in doing that, one can also avoid blockers, like it is shown on the, on the right side, or one can uh, create the notion of uh, a certain root of a beam. Uh, and that is actually something that uh, you can imagine as an extension of uh, the multi-beam um, situation that we use, for example, in wireless now so many years to uh, separate, to partition in angular domains. This is what we do. We've, we've been using beam switching like ages ago. Now with beam bending, this type of orthogonality is maybe a new, more, um, let's say, innovative way of looking at the orthogonality. Because if you are separate these beams in a space, so these bended beams, then in reality, you have created a new orthogonality space where you can partition uh, uh, the environment based on those. So that brings me to the last part, which is trying to make a connection to this uh, uh, ISAC or JSAC or uh, this discussion. And where RIS is viewed as a potential sensor. So what is the logic? The logic is that, uh, okay, we show that uh, you can use RIS to control receive power, to control uh, receive power density. Uh, you can use RIS to uh, partition in angular, in angular domains or in, in uh, radial distances with the focal areas that we talked about. You can use RIS to create uh, pending beams um, or to reconstruct beams after an obstacle. So more or less you can use RIS to engineer the wireless environment, to shape it, to control it, to, to write on it, let's say. But can you use RIS to read? Well, in principle, you should. So the idea is to exploit the properties that we analyze in order to be able to sense the environment. 
of course, uh, sensing might mean detecting objects, tracking, um, locating, localizing, mapping the environment, sensing properties of the environment, etc. So what I'm going to show you is a simple example, uh, which uses very, uh, if you want, uh, straightforward properties that we uh, discussed about to localize. So the idea um, is something that we built on uh, our beamforming tracking algorithm. So the phase one of this approach is actually the, the beamforming tracking algorithm that we've been using in our group for uh, a few years now. But the idea is to essentially partition the environment in angular domains and in range tiers or domains. So these two phases, you can put the one on top of the other, and essentially, essentially you come up with regions, right? That uh, are uh, um, limited by certain angular ranges and certain range limits, if you put these phases. So what you do in phase one is we are using a hierarchical angular tracking algorithm uh, we want to use hierarchical in order to be able to reduce complexity um, because as you see at each step it divides the regime that it is setting into two and selects one out of two and that makes it two n different code words instead of two to the power of n if you did like a blind exhaustive set of the whole space and we do the same using beam focusing to uh, achieve ranging. So, of course, based on uh, the types of, of uh, RISs that you use, you can calculate the resolution in the two regimes, in the angular and in the range. Uh, and you can then uh, identify the hierarchical level um, that you want to uh, use, basically. Um, so it may well be that uh, it's not worth starting from level one, but you may want to, to start from a higher level. But so this is one part of the trade-off. So the other part of the trade-off is that uh, you probably don't want to go to very high level because you have some robustness issues um, associated with... Uh, the accuracy with which you can define these regimes in the angular and in the range domain. So there are, this is the basic principle of the algorithm. And uh, as we speak, we are actually exploring different uh, variants of that, to be honest, because there are so, there's so much to, to tune and to play with in this algorithm that I expect that, okay, there is the basic approach, but uh, there are many other, depending on the scenario, many other promising um, variants of this of this algorithm that we are currently exploring and uh, we expect to be able to publish soon. So this is um, a way to uh, conclude some this kind of uh, journey of uh, RIS uh, learning curve. Um, and uh, I will do that by just showing you um, this new project that started a few months ago and uh, and Marco referred to that. It's called Instinct. So it is a joint communication and sensing project, uh, and uh, it is using RIS as along with other technologies in order to be able to come up with solutions for these scenarios that you want to achieve in order to uh, come up with uh, solutions on immersive connectivity, on intelligent connectivity. Uh, and um, the idea is to uh, be able to come up with uh, a set of enablers that uh, materialize what uh, is called now a uh, multifunctional network. So what is the difference? I think I mentioned that very briefly at the beginning. The difference is that it is not about throughput and capacity only. It is about understanding the environment, sensing different parameters, um, be able to maybe also understand the semantics, for example. So this, what, this is what is called multifunctional, uh, meaning not just communications, but sensing and other um, goals, if you want, for communication as well. 
And um, so the, the main objectives is to use RIS uh, and radar in order to be able to come up with solutions for uh, uh, SANS to communicate. So the idea is that uh, is we're using sensing as an assistant to communication, communicate to sense, which is the other way around. So you're using communication system to do sensing and combine the two in this multifunctional uh, system concept approach. So this is INSTI, so watch this space. Um, and with that, I think I will just uh, close here saying that uh, um, RIS is an important uh, technology because it provides the means to uh, take advantage of uh, the wireless environment uh, in order to be able to tune it, to shape it, and uh, also to understand it and map it. So uh, it may be that uh, it is a, a new MIMO in some sense, uh, but possibly with uh, a few more important attributes to exploit. Um, I think uh, it cannot by itself uh, be the, the only solution, but it would need definitely other enablers, like for example, the use of higher frequencies, uh, the use of sensing, the use of uh, tools like uh, um, AI uh, and machine learning in order to be able to really leverage these new attributes. Um, and also, to be honest, uh, as we are doing this work, and we've been doing that for uh, for a few years now, um, we keep, it's, it's a moving target, I, I have to admit, because uh, for the technology to be successful, you definitely need to identify the scenarios that these attributes are needed or are more, you know, are really easy to, to, to monetize them. I mean, obviously there is no technology that solves all the problems, but there are technologies that can, you know, can be suitable for certain problems. So I think RIS is still trying to find the, uh, the way, you know, towards this uh, uh, scenario where it can best be uh, exploited. I think we have identified several uh, characteristics. So we are not that bad now as we were in uh, 2019 in understanding where to take this technology. But I think we still uh, have something to learn. So with that, I will close my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandra, for the questions from the audience. Yes. Thank you, Angela, for another excellent talk. Uh, but uh, tell me, it's slide 34 uh, you have. Uh, um, I missed that. What is the, yeah, what is the hierarchical level? What is that we are talking about? Um, so the, the algorithm that we're using, we have built an algorithm that uses hierarchical approach to do uh, the angular tracking, phase one, and the range tracking. So in the angular tracking, you build uh, angular domains with beamforming, and in the range, uh, you do focal areas. But you do that uh, uh, by designing uh, code words in a hierarchical fashion. So first, you, as you see uh, at the bottom of uh, your angular domain, you have coarse angular sectors. And then you are able to uh, divide them by two and get them narrower and narrower and narrower. So the more hierarchical layers, uh, levels that you're using, the narrower these regimes are. So the better your localization algorithm uh, behaves. And uh, these diagrams show the resolution that you can achieve. Obviously, you know, if you can come up with uh, narrower angular areas or smaller focal areas, your resolution uh, because within those areas, you cannot tell the difference. So your error is actually equivalent to the size of your final area that you use for localization. So this is just simulation or it is... Uh, this is uh, this is using the analytical forms for the focal areas that I show you. Uh, and
and uh, it uh, it does simulate is simulates the dynamic behavior. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, one of the questions uh, linked to Hinoz, actually. So, uh, what uh, could you say a few words on the, where the computations take place for the, the sensing? So, the, is it something associated with the risk directly? on the base station with the communication of information? I, on I... the base station. So this localization algorithm that I showed you, yes. this is uh, on the base station. Okay. So I... uh, okay. imagine, I mean, phase one, which is the, the normal tra beamforming tracking that uh, people do, and we've, we've studied that quite a lot. Um, what you do, you illuminate different uh, angular sectors. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you need from the UE, a feedback that says that this is uh -huh. like that is already in the standards. I mean, it's not that you're using something additional to that. And that helps you, like, if you see now in uh, 3GPP or in uh, Wi Fi, how they do initial access oh, based time. on being forming, it's the same principle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you locate uh, uh, the user in the Angular domain. And then in phase one, you are able to do the same, let's say, comparison, if you want, of powers in the focal areas. But you search only in the angular domain that you have identified in phase one. It's like a grid, but it is in polar. It's like a grid. Imagine that mm -hmm. there are the angular domains and then the, the range. Okay. So within that grid, you do localization. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we've done it is orthogonal. So phase one and phase two, they are separate. One can create that grid and uh, come up with an algorithm that searches in the vicinity. Uh, so it uh, it it uh, deals with the two regimes, the angular and the range, like they were just uh, the same. And it is only uh, areas that cover. You partition the whole area in in focal areas, if you want. Um, and you search uh, there. I mean, there are many, many variants of this localization algorithm, and there are many ways to also exploit prediction, for example, mm -hmm. to simplify the search, uh, and many, many other approaches in optimization when we search uh, space. And I guess in this case, you you might also, if you have two risks, is uh, you could also do some triangulation and uh, do kind of things. Uh, if, you uh, can, same, yes, same yeah, yes, you could do that. Uh, well, any types of approach of localization. Uh, here, it is only about, uh, if you want uh, locating the um, area, you partitioning uh, the space in areas, and then locating the UE in that area. So that's uh, all. So the, it is, a, let's say, an energy-based comparison that you do. Nothing more than that. Yes. And another question also at the um, so when you discuss this local, uh, optimal um, uh, localization of the risk on this on the line, yeah. The, uh, so uh, I didn't I missed the assumptions on the pass loss, the fading, and uh, things like that. So it, it's it, it's a universal result, or yes, or... there is no uh, so there's no fading. No fading, but the pass loss function is uh, also pass loss. Arbitrary. But no fast fading, nothing no, here. Okay. It's, it's only if you want uh, just to get the analytical, uh, but there's no fast fading or something. Uh -huh. But the, the pass loss, uh -huh. the attenuation function is arbitrary. What you see there, let yeah. me just go back, is um, the is the impact of the actual distance in meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, the impact of the size and the shape of the footprint on the risk, as this is created by the access point. So by moving the RIS, what you change, you change the shape and the size of the footprint mm -hmm. because you have a, let's go there, a fixed uh, transmitter, but you're moving the RIS, right? So, um that changes the receive power 
because then the receiver uh, gets a beam from the RIS of different uh, properties because the aperture is different and the, the shape is different. So this is how the two, uh, so the why is it uh, that we have two maxima in the case of the full illumination? Why is that? It is because uh, in the full illumination, the RIS and the footprint is rectangular. Mm. So if you look at the, the equations, there are two uh, places where you see, you see which places is the places where the maximum happens that are completely equivalent. So the way that, uh, uh, you know, the power that is um, collected and then sent to the uh, receiver is, is exactly the same, mm -hmm. which is not the case for the partial illumination. Okay. But you. there is no stochastic, uh, uh, like fast fading or something is only um, power, so it is the, the uh, electromagnetic field and its power that we are uh, calculating. I see. Just so it's the received power. That's the one over d two. That's what you mean. So the pass yeah. loss is actually yeah. one over the square of distance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question was: uh, you had similar results for other pass loss functions. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. Results for other? No. No. It, it was a question. So yeah. Was... Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, that's the idea that uh, uh, the dependence on the distances is written there in uh, green and uh, okay. brown somehow, and it is different in for the two cases. Why is that? Because of the of the shape of the RIS. Thank you. Can I have a follow-up question? Uh, <laughs> uh, the parameters on this uh, slide, number 12 and 34, are related. I mean, we are talking about in 34 also, uh, the carrier frequency of 100, Ah, uh, yes. Uh, all the results that you see are 150. Okay, okay. so uh, the question is, uh, does the, uh, do the results have anything to do with the usual uh, radar theory of ambiguity function and, you know, waveform design for a particular ambiguity function because this determines the range and ang angular resolution? Um, now, is the question on this or on the algorithm? No, the you, you, I mean, whatever your results, mm -hmm. uh, have you taken into account uh, the waveform design or it is for an arbitrary waveform, the signal waveform, um, because you transmit a signal right. to do all the focusing and uh, to see the reflection from RIS. The, wa the waveform design. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you use the, you can, no, we have not studied this. Okay. But that's uh, very interesting because it may be very important for the sensing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you guys are waiting for a big one. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, uh, I'm wondering about the limitations of the analytical mobilization. So as you uh, stated, uh, they can give us a powerful insight about what is happening. Uh, however, those have some limitations. Could you develop that idea? And also, could you tell us if you did uh, some validations regarding comparing it, for example, with an stochastic model? So what um, we need to, to consider here is the following. Um, it is not that uh, it is an approximation. These are exact uh, analytical forms in most of the cases, or even if they're uh, approximated, when we compare with uh, the arithmetic uh, evaluation is like uh, exact. Um, but uh, imagine, for example, the fast fading aspect of things would come on top of, of that. So one need to understand then in the wireless environment where you have um, maybe fading or severe fading, what is going to happen? So that I would see as an envelope. Uh, in the ideal case when, uh, for example, fading or fading variance is not that severe. Uh, it's not that it is an approximation that we don't know if it stands because this is just a deterministic 
or if you want to look at it differently, it's like you see a snapshot. Somebody takes a photo of, of the system behavior, and for a certain point in time, it behaves like that. But fast fading makes this behavior quite volatile. So obviously, one needs to have proper system simulations with this uh, randomness in it. Having said that, though, um, we have done some work also in Ariadne on uh, sub terahertz channel models. So we know, we understand a little bit about fading. The more you go up in frequency, um, you face situation where um, wireless propagation is quite specular. And this makes it quite manageable if you want, as opposed to having very rich multipath and you don't know, you know, it's, there is so much uh, to say about the um, angular profile and uh, et cetera, and the delay profile. So this is one thing to think about, um, that uh, as you go up in frequencies, this element becomes, if you want, uh, less concerning in the sense that it is not that volatile. But of course, um, and the, within Ariadne, there were um, uh, some uh, measurements that were carried out in uh, Ulu and uh, uh, Alto. Uh, and we have um, actually real data, and we have done work on fitting this data and coming up with channel models that we could use on top of that in order to get a more realistic, if you want, part, but now of the stochastic behavior of this approach. So you see, it may be, for example, that uh, this maxima that you see there they're there when you have a static or a stable behavior, but when the behavior becomes very volatile, then these are distorted, these maxima are distorted, you see? But you need to start from somewhere, and um, deployment issues um, and uh, optimizing the placement of network elements usually should take into account either some analytical or deterministic uh, uh, values or some expectations or some you know statistics right there is no way you can really match the fast uh, fading for example but you want to match expectation or uh, analytical expressions upper bounds so in that respect i think uh, that's that's why we want to to understand this because we this all this could be the reference uh, equation for optimization tools. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a few questions, uh, one question. So in, on page uh, 33, actually, uh, for angular and uh, hierarchical tracking, if I understood correctly, you mentioned that you are uh, doing the base, base station beamforming rather than uh, reconfiguring the RIS itself. Is it, is it correct? So what you what you tune is the way that you illuminate the RIS. But uh, so the thing is that uh, um, by doing this, because the base station's location is fixed already, mm -hmm. and your wrist is also already fixed. So are you changing the uh, you're changing the beam you're changing the beam that you illuminate the the ris so this is what you want to do okay and also doing so are you doing this uh angular and hierarchical tracking jointly or separately separately separately, separately. that's why it's phase one and phase two so the way we present it it was the simplest approach we could take in order to be able to understand the potential of that in terms of uh, resolution, for example. Uh, there are many ways of uh, of looking at it. You can, mm -hmm. I mean, some people talk about uh, using only focus, only being focusing, mm -hmm. and using focal area as, as the orthogonal uh, uh, areas. I mean, there, there are different, uh, different variants of that. And are you yeah. using this uh, similar to iterative algorithm by like, you know, changing the, every time this is being forming and seeing if it is increased, for example, then you are, uh, you, for example, your received power in, in UE is increased, then you are assuming that you are in the correct uh, tracking, angular tracking. It is essentially an exhaustive way of searching, mm -hmm. 
but it is an, a hierarchical uh, exhaustive way of searching. So um, like it is shown in phase one, um, then uh, the first V informer is just uh, you, the lowest um, code, code word, uh, just uh, separates in two uh, regimes, the blue, mm -hmm. and then you identify that you are in one, and then this one is separated in, into two, and uh, the, in that way you are using um, this hierarchical way, kind of saves you, you know, complexity in, in a way. Uh, why is that? Because uh, uh, if you go, like it is happening in initial access for in 3GPP and Wi-Fi, they separate, for example, the, ang the angular uh, regime in um, a number of uh, beams. And they check one by one. So this uh, would mean that, uh, you know, you have to really do the exhaustive search. And if you require a certain uh, resolution, then this beams should be really, really narrow, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas now you are um, uh, basically flexible in that. You can choose what is the resolution that you want and you can go up to that hierarchical level. Mm -hmm. So you can always um, control the trade-off between resolution, required resolution and uh, uh, complexity in that one. Perfect, thank you so much.